All right, uh, nobody really wants to hear me talk for a full hour, so let's make this quick. Um, my name's Owen, I own Imperial Yeast. We've been running a couple years. Uh, we're out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, anybody that wants to drop by, just give us a shout. If it's lunchtime, we'll buy you a burrito. So, first things first, from Oregon, we would like to say congratulations. So, I had like a really awesome Snoop Dogg gif and then it didn't load and it's like, all right, whatever, this stock art, it'll work. <laughs> uh, strong, strong start. Um, all right, this is what we're gonna, a uh, couple questions, I guess, gauge the audience a little bit. I had no idea coming into this. My Most of my memories last time was sitting outside direct tap, freezing drunk, waiting for a taxi. Um, <laughs> It'd be awesome if you guys could get um, Lyft or Uber in this town. It'd be rad. Um, uh, so, anybody have a problem with reading? All right, so we're all good readers. I'm gonna try not to read the slides. Uh, who's starting a brewery? Okay, uh, how many people under 10 barrel? Or 10 heck, uh, 20 heck? Above 30 heck. Okay, so we kind of got the whole gamut. Graham's not going to listen to me anyways. Um, so this is what we're going to go over. Uh, we have a metric shit ton of slides to do. I'm going to skip over a bunch of them. Uh, kind of go uh, based on questions and where the talk goes. Um, uh, if you're already tired and you want to get up and leave at any time, you're not going to break my heart. I promise you. Uh, so, start off strain selection. You know, beer style, flocculent, non flocculent, yada, yada, yada. Who understands so far? <laughs> awesome, we are doing so good. So, I'm really proud of this stock photo as well here. <laughs> I got the gamut from a light beer to a dark beer in there. Uh, we did have to add hazies into this talk for the first time. I've been trying to fight against them for several years and not try to talk about them, but I um, figured it's about time. So, uh, do you guys have milkshake IPAs up here? Yeah. How many people drink milkshake IPAs? Like the general rule. I am so proud of you. Um, so, uh, you know, strain selection really depends on style, depends on a whole bunch of stuff that we'll go over. So, uh, you want hazy, fruity, clean, uh, flocking characteristics. If you get a non flocking at least, you really don't have to worry about diastole. It's going to stay up in suspension, probably save two to three days on your D rest versus a really flocculent strain. Uh, if you're switching over to pub or the fuller strain, That'll drop out like cottage cheese prior to, um, uh, I can speak in Y East numbers or White Labs numbers or my numbers. Um, so if anybody doesn't understand when I say a stray name, just raise your hand, please. Uh, these all make sense as we go along. So we have highly flocculent strains, really gotta worry about diastole the higher up you get. And then attenuation is more uh, flocculent. There's a higher correlation between flocculation, high flocculation and low attenuation than there is with the yeast strain itself. Most yeast strain are gonna be within a point or two of it, each other. You're just gonna see, if you look at our list or anybody else's, uh, you want a highly attenuative strain, you're probably not gonna choose a really flocculent strain if you can get around it. Anybody agree with that? No? We've lost the crowd already. <coughs> Chain formers. So this is juice and a lot of your um, uh, hazy beers. This is a hazy slide. So these, so A38 juice, London 3, I'm not sure what, what does White Labs call that one? Uh, hmm? No, that's the Barbarian, uh, I think. Uh, but they don't really cleave, so you need a ton of headspace. 
And it's really easy if you're trying to maximize your tank volume to blow off way too much yeast with these strains out of the top of your tank. So with your hazies, you really want a lot of um, headspace. Also helps if you're dry hopping and you don't want beer showers up there. Um, and that's going to lead to stalled and incomplete fermentations. So those last slides were kind of bullshit. What am I doing sitting here? So I have a couple practical slides in here. Uh, this is the way to tell if it's yeast haze or protein haze. Is, who's seen this before? Oh, sweet. So most of your, um, I used to work for Y yeast. I got, when I was there and when I started Imperial, I got yelled at because my yeast wouldn't flock. And then the last couple years I get yelled at because it flocks out of suspension too much. So um, this little test is super easy to run, and it's going to let you know if your uh, haze is yeast or protein. So all you're doing is grabbing a couple mils of, anybody know what that chemical is? Caustic. Um, throw it in a centrifuge tube, leave some headspace in there, two samples, two mils of caustic, shake it. If it gets clearer or clearer, you're going to you're dealing with protein. So if you're wondering how the brewery next door is trying to do or gets that much consistent haze, you can test it. For yeast, almost 99% of consistent haze is tannin or uh, protein. Most barbarian uh, juice, most of our uh, um, kind of sexy hazy strains, uh, are going to be very good flockers. They're pretty big cell size. They're heavy. They'll sit up on top with a lot of headspace, but when they do drop back in the suspension, they're going to drop pretty clear. That makes sense? Did we learn something already? Yeah. All right. I should retire right now. So another thing to look at, tank residency time. How many brews can I do a month? Uh, how many people run a business? I run two. I really like to make money because I hate um, overdue bills and I don't like the months where I don't get paid running a business. Those months kind of suck. Anybody else not get paid here? Brewery owners? Awesome. It's just me. Uh, and I can't see any of you because there's two floodlights, so I'm kind of blind. So you'll have to speak up a little bit. Um, there's some strains that are going to come out faster. And part of this is pitch rate dependent, but how fast can I turn these beers? Um, you know, most people that we're working with are doing lagers in 19 days, uh, ales in 14. Primary fermentation with a good pitch rate should be done in five days. Uh, I did during the hazy talk. I heard a couple things that were awesome, like don't repitch your yeast, like from a yeast supplier that just warms my little heart. <laughs> makes <laughs> makes me so happy. Uh, uh, I also did hear that uh, under pitching and low attenuation to push uh, ester profile. Um, that's great if you're not re-pitching that yeast, but that's a uh, recipe for stalls, in my opinion, and uh, stressing it out. I think there's easier ways to dial in flavor profile with temperature and higher pitch rates than there is running the gamut of uh, lower pitch rates. But, uh, you know, everybody runs a business or hopefully is looking at a business and how fast you can turn those tanks. So how many people run centrifuges? You can use really whatever strain you want. Um, how many people have flat dish bottom tanks? Yeah, you guys can use like two. <laughs> so, you know, if you're using a short fat tank, you got to use anybody open ferment here or open harvest. Once again, speak up. Nose? OK, awesome. We won't talk about that. So you know, blah, blah, blah. We went through all these different factors. Who really knows? Um, the big thing is everybody in this room is different. So if you're starting a brewery or you're designing a new beer, um, really like to have you give us a shout or whatever yeast supplier you want to use. And they should be going through. Uh, tank geometry with you. They should be going through how fast you need to use those tanks. Should be going through flavor profile with you. They should be going through 
um, what you got for findings, what you got for centrifuge, how fast you need to move. And from there, we should be able to dial things down and choose one of the 250 strains in the bank that is really going to work for you. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so moving on. Pitching. Obviously, I used a picture of our stuff. Um, going to talk about propagation on how not to give me money as well in this talk. So how much yeast do you need? Uh, pitch rate. Who speaks, who doesn't speak Play-Doh here? Okay, there's enough people that I'll just speak in Play-Doh. Um, what pitch rates do you guys use? Anybody? One million per mil per degree. Mil? Seven kilograms. Seven milligrams? Seven kilograms. <laughs> Kilograms? That probably works better than milligrams, right? I'm not that great with the metric system, but one of those sounds better. Uh, you know, ales, we really want to be around 0.75 million cells per mil per degree plato. Lots of words. What it really is is a way to keep the amount of yeast cells consistent as your sugar goes up. So sugar goes up, yeast goes up. Sugar goes down, you can pitch less yeast. Make sense? Once again, you guys have to talk a little bit in this. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll just skip and we can all go drink beer if it gets real quiet. I understand that at some stage I'm going to lose the room pretty badly today. And uh, I won't make everybody sit through it. Uh, loggers, usually we want to be at about a mil to uh, two mil. Uh, you're fermenting colder. Uh, Fermentation is chemical reaction. Every 10 degrees Celsius, things double in speed. So if you're dropping... Um, 10 or 15 degrees in lagering temperature versus ale, it's going to take a lot more time. You really don't want the lager sitting in a very alcoholic solution with a lot of acid and a lot of alcohol um, sitting there. So we want a bigger pitch so it can chew through it faster even though we're using less or at a colder temperature. Does that make sense? Sweet. Talking. It's great. Um, uh, special strains, Belgian, German wheats. These are ones that I would play around with your pitch rate. Your ester phenol balance is pitch rate dependent on these strains. So like Stefan, uh, we name all of our German strains after Saturday Night Live characters. Uh, 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 Stefan is the Weinstefan strain. Uh, if you pitch that at, say, 5 million cells per mil, you're going to get almost all banana. Uh, you pitch it at about 10 million cells per mil, you're going to get it banana and clove, and about 13 to 14, it's really hard to get any banana. You almost have clove, unless you're doing a, uh, a beer above about 7.5%, and then that alcohol is going to act like the under pitch, and you're going to get that strain, same stress response and kick out a lot of banana. So with the Belgian and German wheats, you can really play around. That's the only time I personally would drop below 0.75 million cells per mil per degree plate. I was having if it's really trying to push banana. So propagation. I'm going to make this obviously really difficult to understand so everybody just buys direct pitches from me. Um, uh, so prop steps. If you're using 10% of your final volume, so if, you're, if you have a barrel of yeast to play around with or a heck of yeast and you're going into 10 heck, you can pitch at about 5 million cells per mil as a minimum into that barrel. If you got 20% of your final, so 2 heck versus into 10 heck, you want to up your rate because you're not going to get as much growth out of it. So pitch at about 10 million cells per mil. Big beers, I love taking people's money. I do run a business. I'll come back to that several times. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense to buy a direct pitch. Uh, for a single beer. I would always try to plan your brews out where you're harvesting out of a small beer and keeping that, keeping some of it alive and then throwing it over at the big beer and dropping it. That's about above 17 Play-Doh. You'll really start to see some issues on repitching. Questions there? Here's an example. Blah, blah, blah. Big thing is give it a shout. Um, I don't care how you get to the right amount of cells, I just want you to get to the right amount of cells. 
Um, I used to work for a different yeast lab. I'd travel around the country drinking beer and teaching people about fermentation. It was a pretty sweet job. Uh, the big thing that I ran into is I like my yeast on Gen 2 or I like my yeast on Gen 3. And yeast doesn't magically become better at eating sugar on Gen 2 or Gen 3. You're just building up enough of a culture that you can actually see what that yeast is going to do throughout. Um, you actually get a lot more generations from your yeast if you don't stress it out on Gen 1 or Gen 2. That's why we, when we started the lab, we won in at double Y yeast and triple white labs for uh, what we recommend going forward. Um, as a correlate to that, I ask you to buy more yeast even though I'm cheaper by sell. Um, everybody runs a business, you don't want to spend money on yeast. So happy to help you out with prop schemes. Uh, just give us a shout. All we need to know is how much time you have for the propagation and how much starter wort you can get and we can get you sorted out and make sure that you're uh, spending as least money as possible. Questions? Good opportunity to say no. Okay. So DO, who has a DO meter? Who can borrow it from somebody in this room? The people with DO meters are super friendly. Um, uh, you know, 8 ppm is atmospheric. Uh, 28 is about the most you can ever get to dissolve into your beer uh, and into your wort. You're never going to kill yeast by having too much oxygen in uh, it. just can't happen. They'll take it up too fast. I guess if you leave it on for like five days straight, but your beer probably tastes like shit anyways. Um, uh, really good to borrow a DO meter if you don't have one, so you're not estimating, you're not saying liters per minute. Um, uh, and then if you know your pitch rate's low, you want to up your oxygen, double or triple your O2 from what you normally do. If you do have a harvest and your harvest is coming in pretty low, uh, how many people are counting here? How many people just say, eh, fuck it, push it over? Sweet. We're getting to the point in the talk where people are honest. Um, uh, most people just say, fuck it, push it over. Uh, if it looks thin, use more DO. Um, oxygen can make up for lower pitch rates to a point. Uh, juice, it's our Boddington or 1318. Uh, the more we sell a lot of that strain, uh, it really needs a ton of oxygen to finish out. Same with Barbarian. You'll see some lagging with it, both on the front side and the back side, if you uh, don't give it a ton of O2. Yep? Can I over-oxygenate? No. Uh, I don't believe so. I don't believe hot side aeration is a real thing. Um, um, it's probably a point where people can be like, you're bullshitting me, that's a fucking lie. Um, uh, I, I don't believe it. Uh, O2, it's, yeast will go after zinc first and then oxygen second. And if you're taking oxygen readings out of your tank after you run in, they're really effective at it. They will go to town really, really fast and drive your O2 level down. Um, I don't know anybody without leaving pure O2 on for days and days and days um, that can kill yeast. Throughout our propagations, we don't use O2, we just use filtered air, and we are continually running filtered air through our, um, I don't care about the beer taste, it all goes down the drain. I started a business where I dump 90% of what I make down the drain, not super awesome. Um, I don't think you can. Probably should have just said no, right? Sorry. Thank you for interrupting, asking a question, not interrupting. So, fermentation. Um, uh, your fermentation is going to act really different based on strain, pitch rate, temperature, DO. Those are your big, big variables coming into it. So, yes. At the bottom. Sorry, I couldn't fix it last night. Once again, with the Snoop Dogg GIF, I just couldn't fix the fermentation. A um, couple of vitality tests you can do. First one is just taking a graph, and it's taking a consistent at X hours after knockout. We take it. If you can check pH, that's really good. pH should be the first indication of a uh, 
healthy fermentation. Here you should see your pH drop before your gravity drop. Uh, after that, it's really nice to say, hey, I'm eight hours in and I'm only seeing a, uh, uh, normally I've dropped five Play-Doh, now I've only dropped three Play-Doh. Or at that stage, it's still early enough that you can call us or call your yeast supplier or call somebody else and there's a lot of troubleshooting that you can do there and try to get that culture healthy again uh, so it can knock it out so you're not dumping beer or doing a one-off or something like that. And, um, and that is really cheap. It's just taking gravities at the same amount of time after knockout. So this is the other one you can do. This is like one of three slides. If you're going to pay attention, I would pay attention to this one. Uh, doing this is gospel every single time. It's really, really nice. Force ferment test. Uh, in 48 hours, you should know best case attenuation for that specific batch. Um, it's really nice to have this data so when something does get all messed up, you can come back and say, hey, my force ferment, I normally go down to four Play-Doh or three Play-Doh. My force ferment is stalling at six Play-Doh. Um, and then when your beer stalls at six Play-Doh, you can say it's on the mash side and you can go yell at your grain supplier and not yell at me. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. Anybody? Sweet. Thank you. I've given like three talks in a row and nobody said a goddamn thing. So I'm happy to break that. Probably shouldn't. I, excuse me, I should have started my talk with, I do have a tendency to use foul language, especially in front of large groups of people. Um, thank you. Uh, all right. Your last practical slide after this, excellent chance to duck out. BDK, um, I really like to do triangle testing and make sure you're cooling your heated sample down to room temp so you can't, if you grab a hot coffee mug or a hot sample, your brain will automatically know it's the heated sample and you can trick yourself into smelling BDK when it's not there. And having a triangle test with multiple people when the liquid is at the same uh, do people understand what a triangle test is? Yes. Yes. Yeah, use triangles. <laughs> um, so there's our protocol for VDKs. I think they have this talk someplace. So you, there we go. So harvesting. It's just disjointed, isn't it? It's just kind of hard to listen to. Harvest when, harvesting hazies, and how. So nobody really top crops, that's ridiculous. Um, uh, I don't know anybody, there's like one or two people that do it and it's just like, what the hell are you doing, man? That's just dumb. Um, so uh, you wanna get the yeast out of your fermenter as soon as possible. So you don't wanna steal from your current batch, but you, you wanna make sure you're not sitting there. When the yeast is in the bottom of your cone, it's building up a lot of temperature internally there's always a hot spot in the bottom of your cone, um, and it's starving. It's still trying to eat, it's just dropped out of suspension, there's not enough CO2 or activity to keep it up there, uh, and it's sitting in alcohol and pH, which are the two biggest stressors for them, or alcohol and acid, um, which are the two biggest stressors. So as soon as you can, get your yeast out and get it into a brink if possible. So if you are gonna top crop, do it when the yeast is on the top. Yeah. Maybe next time I'll make that its own slide. Uh, harvesting hazies. Um, uh, two different ways to do it. Uh, really tough and you're going to get a low cell count going forward with it. Um, first is doing multiple harvests prior to dry hop. So if you're going to dry hop 36, 48 hours in, come back 24 hours and grab what's ever in the bottom of the tank. So blow your tube, grab it, harvest it. And then come back right before dry hopping and do a multiple harvest. Sometimes you can get enough yeast to keep that going. Um, real careful, if you're pulling into a, a vessel that holds pressure, you are pulling sugar in with that and it'll have a tendency to explode, which isn't super kosher. Um, you can also do a light, light crash where right before dry hopping you can drop your temp a little bit and force that yeast out of suspension, start slowing it down. Um, 
depending on the strain, it can take a fairly decent temperature drop and then come back at it. And all you're trying to do is force whatever yeast is towards the bottom to drop out so you don't have to give me more money. But once again, that hazy talk this morning, I agree with not reusing your yeast. It's awesome. Uh, harvesting setup. Uh, this is what we use to harvest all of our yeast. So autoclavable, cheap, no place for anything to hide in there. Um, we're just doing a racking arm that pops up and you can just harvest super slowly into anything. Everything we do just goes into those jugs unless it's coming out of a really big tank and then it goes into a mixed tank. But um, costs you like 50 bucks on GW Kent. Cool? It's a nice picture, huh? Storage. This is about as um, complicated of a brink as I think most people ever should have. Uh, really don't like any NTP fittings. Uh, that's just a six inch tri-clamp welded on with an in and an out. Whole thing can be disassembled. Whole thing can, can tear it apart, can clean it really easy. Um, make sense? Who has something like that? Who spent a lot more money for something a lot more complicated than that? Uh, here's a big brink. Uh, notice both these have flat bottoms. I really wouldn't use a brink with a cone. You're going to build up a lot of heat in it. That's a propagator, not a brink. Uh, that's full sales brink. Uh, I think it's like a 10 barrel uh, brink and it's pitching 240s all day long. So you don't really need a ton of size for your brink. Here's a small brink. It's the same container that we uh, ship it in. Uh, these can be purchased for about $5.99 from carry.com. Or you can just ask for an extra one on your order. Um, these are actually really good. It's easy. You can watch. They'll show signs of expansion. So when it, you walk into the walk-in, you're like, holy shit, that thing's going to blow. You can open it up really easily. And they're cheap enough you can throw them away. So you can use it twice, three times, reuse it. Um, no reason to be super fancy. How long to store your yeast? Um, hours is great. So if you can plan your next brew to harvest out and get it right back in there, that's what the yeast wants. It really doesn't want to be starving. Um, days are OK, weeks. Um, don't loan it to somebody else who's really clean, and then get it back from them in a little bit. Questions there? Yeah, most of this stuff is pretty basic. Yeah? Question is, when you're crashing beer out that doesn't need to be dry hopped, uh, what's the optimum time to let it sit before you harvest it? Uh, depends on your strain, your tank geometry. Uh, as soon as you can get it out, um, the better. But you don't want to just harvest. You don't want to leave a ton in the tank. Um, honestly, with pub, it's probably like 45 minutes. Uh, uh, with um, Stefan or Whiteout or something like that, it might be two days, something like that. The sooner you can get it out of your brink, the better. We put. Uh, through all of our stuff. As soon as we harvest, we put it in the fridge. Then we pour off our supernatant and replace with sterile water uh, as early on in the process so we can increase pH and decrease alcohol. Um, uh, yeast really doesn't like to sit in acid and alcohol. That's why it kicks it outside of its cells, um, which is awesome. Um, so just as soon as possible based on the strain or tank geometry. Anybody disagree with that? How about one of those questions? You guys make beer, I don't. Sweet. Who's storing in a fermenter? Cool. Yeah, it's storing a brain. Questions on that? Tough slide. <laughs> Quantification. Weight versus volume. 
Don't use volume. Yeah. See, we back to the weight. Perfect. Um, uh, based on your cell size, based on how many CO2, how much CO2 is in suspension, uh, flagship uh, Barbarian will hold a lot of CO2 in suspension. They just do. That's they get. Um, pains to work with on a production level for us, but that's really going to throw off. It can throw off your, you can be 30 to 40 percent variance really, really easy, and it's going to look the same. So, recommend doing weight across the board. Beautiful microscope and hemocytometer. We tried to bring these across the border last time. Last year I gave a yeast talk. The Canadian government did not like when you bring microscopes across the border. Not at all. It was like seven and a half hours and finally they felt bad for me and they let me through. So we're not going to do another yeast talk with microscopes. Calculators. Uh, we can email you this if you want. We have our calculator. Um, any calculator that goes viability based on time. Does anybody use those? Yeah. The viability aspect of any calculator is complete bullshit. Um, absolute garbage. I have people on a homebrew level email like weekly, like this yeast is six weeks old, so it's only 12% viable and now I have to go buy like 15 packs of yeast. And I say, yeah, you should. Um, uh, uh, viability depends on strain and it depends on alcohol and pH and what it's sitting in. Um, general rule, uh, rule, uh, uh, the ale strains are going to hold up a lot better. The worst ones will be the um, wheat strains. Wheat strains look like shit after like two, three weeks under optimum conditions. Uh, we can't hold those as long internally as we can hold some other strains. A uh, big thing with the calculator is just being able to quantify the amount. So once you count your yeast, you understand how much yeast is in a little tiny amount, and then you can bring that up. Um, just do it based on weight. I can email this over if you grab a card or something like that. It's just Owen at Imperial Yeast. QC, who has plating here? Who has PCR? Okay. So we, do you guys, we'll go over it. <laughs> so once again, we get to use this. Did I push the wrong button? Blah, blah, blah. Force for man. Everybody remember that one? What does it do? Why do you run a force ferment test? Yeah, I just want to hear you talk. Um, we did talk about it like 20 slides ago. There's way too many slides in this presentation. Uh, how often should you do a force ferment test? Yep, every single time. Or should you do it just when you have an issue? when people start fucking with me from the audience. It's fun. Uh, microbiological plating. Uh, who, how many people plate? Is that about 10% of the room? Um, uh, really good to do on your beer. Uh, no, nothing is sterile. If you plate a large amount, absolutely nothing is sterile. You'll always find something else. It really just matters how much of something you have in there. Uh, and at that level, is it going to be an issue? You know, if we have PDO, is it going to be an issue? Probably not. Don't sit on your beer for two years. Uh, if we have diastaticus in there, is it going to be an issue? Like, yeah, a little bit of that is really, really, really bad. Um, so if you can plate, great. Is there any local companies that will plate for you from time to time up here? Okay. Somebody might want to start that up. Uh, we started using a PCR this year. Um, it's basically a machine that you put little pregnancy tests into, and it looks for a single part of DNA, and it says, yeah, you got a problem, or no, you're all good. Um, they're pretty cheap. Uh, they only run about five grand, but each little pregnancy test is about 20 bucks. So it's the guns and bullets. They want to sell you bullets. Um, uh, poly chain reaction. Uh, there's a couple different vendors of these. 
Uh, we had uh, quite a hard time getting Invisible Sentinel to where we were happy with it. I don't know if there's an Invisible Sentinel sales rep in the room, but um, uh, we had some issues with it. Uh, if you're having issues, ask them to send you the media that is um, green, not the yellow media. Um, they'll like, you literally, they're like, you say, I have an issue and they send you another bottle of media and it's a completely different color and you're like, dude, that's like super different. That shouldn't be kosher, but it is. Um, that, this machine will allow you to look at very small, uh, it'll, it'll sort for very small snippets of DNA and it'll multiply that snippet over and over and over again. It's not gonna tell you how much of an issue you have, it's just gonna tell you if you have an issue. Has anybody had a recall based on diastaticus up here? Who knows what diastaticus, who doesn't know what diastaticus is? Okay, uh, who does? Sweet, anybody wanna help me out? Nope. I wanted secondary prices. What? Yeah, so yeast it can eat everything. So it'll uh, excrete glucoamylase extracellularly. So basically all your long chain sugars that are left over are an available food source. Uh, bottles and cans will blow up with one Play-Doh of fermentation uh, in a closed package, so it's not good to have that. Uh, this machine will allow you to test for very small bits of it. Um, I would, if you're looking at buying a machine, I would buy a machine where your vendor that you're getting or other people in your community can speak the same language because um, all these machines are a little bit different and so we'll see positives on one and not positives on another. So, does that make sense? It's random. Repitching, yeast washing, who does that? Who doesn't know what it is? Okay. Um, it's beta knockback bacteria. If you're gonna do it, do it just a couple hours to pitching and do it every time. You don't wanna do it beforehand. You're basically dropping the pH of your slurry down to where yeast can survive but bacteria can't. But you really don't want your slurry to sit in a very acidic solution. Um, so do it a couple hours beforehand and just do it each time. Uh, honestly, it's not gonna kill other, it's not gonna kill other yeast, it's not gonna, it's just extra work for your seller team. If you don't like them, make them do it. Um, Brink, I'm gonna pitch the correct amount by weight again. Cone to cone. So the big thing here is you wanna get creative on a way to quantify weight or volume. Honestly, you can make anything up and it's fine. Yeah, there's not a really good way to do it. Uh, and then counting after knockout, anybody do this? Once again, it's extra work for your seller team if you don't like them, excellent job, make them do it. Or your lab team at this stage. Um, we did some tests, it's really, really difficult. You'll, right after knockout, you have really varying cell counts depending on where you are inside your tank. Uh, so you never get an accurate reading, or I don't, I don't believe you can get an accurate reading if you like extra work. Generations. How many generations should you use your yeast? What answer do I want to hear? One, two, we can go three, it's fine. Um, you wanna use your yeast as long as you can because you run a business and you like money. Um, there's no set amount of generations that yeast can go. Uh, there are some people that really shouldn't repitch at Gen 3 that have consistent issues. And there are some people at Gen 45 or 50 have done a really good job keeping things clean and they're getting consistent fermentation profiles, consistent flavor profiles. Uh, keep it going. Um, one thing, if you do want to switch for generations, is figuring out how much, what number works in your business plan for, like, you know, I want a dollar per heck for fermentation costs, or I want 50 cents per heck, or I want three bucks per heck, or I'm making a hazy IPA and people pay an ungodly fucking amount of money for them. So it really doesn't matter, we'll buy it every time. Um, whatever that number is, um, 
do the math on how many gens you have to get out there and fudge a little bit, go farther. So when you have to, when somebody messes up your yeast, like we'll probably get a lot of QC calls after every time, like honestly the A team comes to this thing or MBAAs or anything else, like the good guys get to come and you're leaving kind of the, the JV in front of the seller. So there's people like making me a lot of money right now, like dumping yeast or doing really stupid stuff. So um, you want to plan for that. Um, but figuring out, you know, eight to 10 gens with two to three pitches per generation should get you down into like the 75 cent per heck cost for fermentation. You should be the absolute cheapest thing you use. Um, you know, so all of that is going to tell you how many gens you can go. If your PCR comes back positive for diastaticus, trash it. Um, if your attenuation, your forced ferment start messing up, trash it. Um, but if it looks good, keep using it. Don't give me money. See how many slides we got through? And it was just me. It wasn't a panel. <laughs> What's up, man? So if you fill a tank right to the top and you use a yeast that's really active and it folds a lot and you cover your floor with blow off, does that have any uh, ramifications for uh, the yeast cell generation generation? Are you losing too many cells at the pipe? Yeah, it's really bad for it. Okay, sweet. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, it depends on the strain you have, and if you're limited in tanks, you know. Uh, I've heard real estate is expensive in this city. Not quite sure. Um, you guys aren't a weed state yet. Like, I operate businesses in like Washington, Oregon, Colorado. Like, legal weed, that's the worst thing. It's so expensive because those guys make so much money for like a year before they all go bankrupt. Um, uh, but if you're in like an old building with tiny little tanks and you absolutely need to maximize your volume, uh, we're going to choose a non-chain forming strain and make sure that we, we keep the yeast in suspension so you're not blowing it out the top. We see a lot of, if somebody calls up and they say, hey, I have a pitch of juice and it, it died at blah, 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 you're like, how much of it went on the floor? And they're like, most of it. And you're like, yeah, okay. So, yep. Uh, yes. No, by the time you're, no, the yeast are going to go to town on it and you're probably, unless you're running a really big beer, you're only aerating once early on. If you are running a giant beer and you have a low pitch rate, you can come back and oxygenate like six hours in. Uh, it's a lot better to kind of supercharge yeast at the front than have them stall out and have to like spend an extra week to chew through that. But I don't think anti-foamer has any, the yeast are really, really effective at sucking up O2. Once again, I told you nobody wanted to listen to me talk for an hour. Are we getting close? The question is, for strains like Triple Double, do we suggest top cropping? Um, I don't know anybody that can top crop. Do you, do you for open fermenters? Um, there are some Belgian strains, and like our uh, our Timothy Taylor strain, uh, it's I think it's Fluff or something like that in the bank. Uh, that one over time, that's the the one that is made in uh, square fermenters, where they top cropped over and over and over again. So the yeast that floated to the top got to eat more sugar, so they select for a certain population of the culture. There's a couple strains like that that it's fine to do. It's just really hard to keep things sterile uh, and sterile to the point. There's a ton of atmospheric yeast. You're not going to be able to bring them out as many generations before you start getting off flavors from something else that's in the, in the air that's going to do bad things to your beer. That answer your question? Cool. All right, guys. Thank you very much.